from Sky, uh, Skyfish will let him introduce himself. Um, everyone give a big hand to what is it? Horace Pilskans. Horace Pilskans. Then uh, we're hoping to get a higher safety level. 
what are some of the other issues that we came across? Well, uh, losing radio uh, control connections. We've all been, um, since entering the uh, UAV business, we've lost control of one of uh, the UAVs, and it's not, uh, not fun. But even if you have an autonomous flight, what happens if your GPS, um, magnetic interference, for example? Um, we've had the issue of uh, somebody who was one, one of our trainers testing our software, and they placed the GPS over one of the ESCs. And all of a sudden, if the autonomous flight had it was flying out because of electromagnetic interference with the covers. So even autonomous systems can have, have issues. And the worst case scenario is that you're going to end up colliding and probably, probably have uh, property damage, and that's, uh, that's kind of the, the worst result for the industry. So we, we really want to um, look at uh, safety as the primary driver. What are some of the reasons? Well, I, I mentioned manual control. There can be pilot error, and that leads back to the um, uh, harping on the high operational complexity. Drop links. Uh, with autonomous control, we've seen erroneous GPS and compass communication issues. We've seen software malfunction. And really, for both manual control and, and autonomous, you can have hardware failures or changing flight conditions. A storm or windstorm comes in, and you can't predict it. But I would say in defense that this can happen really to full scales as well, right? Okay, so how do we go about um, tackling these problems? Well, when we started out in the industry, this was the typical UAV system that we encountered. You had your flight controller, and it talks with various uh, systems, sensors, the navigation, Mechanical systems like the ESCs and the motors, communication devices, the camera, and finally the RC module and talks to the flight control. So we tried to add functionality to this system, and the first one that we, we dealt with was the APM and the TICOT. And we wanted to add, for instance, a line of interest. We were like, well, that's pretty easy. Just put a bunch of points of interest together, and you get your line of interest. We had a customer that wanted to fly a pipeline. And that's wanted to keep the craft orthogonal to the pipeline in flight, you didn't want this adjusting camera to each one of the points along the way. So we said, let's go look at the Picot. Oh, they don't have a line of interest. This should be easy to add. Well, it wasn't. And we, we found out that adding any functionality turned out to be uh, a major you know, headache, and we were coming up with a reliable system. So we modified it. We said, okay, let's talk to a device, a device we trust. It's all built in house. And forget about all the functionality on the flight controller. We're going to use only the very basic, uh, very basic functions of the flight controller. And we can test the heck out of that. So this changed everything. It allowed us to interact with each one of the sensors, take control of the flight controller, and now adding functionality. Uh, suddenly became reasonable to us. What should the onboard AI be able to do? Well, it should be able to manage flight controllers. And I say flight controllers because you can actually manage several controllers. What if one of them fails? You can move over to the other controller. It needs to gather and synchronize data. It has to deal with navigation and planning, safety, either via learning or expert systems, communication, interperipheral communication, network communication, and management of the peripheral equipment. So it's a pretty big uh, laundry list that the onboard AI has to do. So we're basically taking over most of the control of the flight control. So the sky, the sky node uh, is what we're calling this uh, new architecture. Um, we consider everything a peripheral, even the flight controller, and we just write a driver for the peripheral requires a simple driver and uses a publish subscribe and API. Uh, so where are we at? Well, phase one, we wanted to have that basic command and control that we got in our uh, flight controller that we initially started to use. So we basically wanted to replicate, but have it use our system instead of the flight controller. Well, we did that. So now we're into peripheral control. Finally, this is actually where we're at. We're making the advanced functionality for doing orthomos 
fixed, advanced safety, and auto charging. We've always uh, lived by keeping it simple. If we could not keep it simple, we simply did not add it into the software. We had to, if we, if it took three or four steps to do, we said it's not good enough. Figure out how to do it in one step or two steps, and we're not going to add it into the software. Once again, to keep that uh, complexity down. The users use the interface. As a matter of fact, uh, a little story we had at uh, the University of uh, Missoula, Montana. Um, uh, we had the one of the University of Montana departments over at Forest Street, and they uh, they had been using various um, uh, they had purchased various drones, and uh, they simply said we keep crashing, we have problems. We we're looking for a solution um, that's easy to use. And I said, well, I'll give this a try, and I put it in the, the gentleman's hands, generator in his hand. And he goes, no, 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 I just crashed the drone yesterday. Don't you know? I'll, I'll crash it. I said, nope, just give it a try. I said, I'm not going to tell you how it works. Just give it a try. A few minutes later, he had a smile on his face. He had a UAV in the air. Um, and, of course, we had the pilot uh, with him in control uh, on RC backup. And he was putting in the uh, uh, waypoints. He goes, oh, can I pause it? I said, yep. Can I upload a new plan? Can I change it? And he learned how to use our system. And we kind of lived by that. Anybody can fly. So what this allowed us to do is create an easy touch screen interface. Um, this actually has more complexity on it than what we actually have. I was going to show you that in a live demonstration, but I guess the internet uh, is um, not the best. So I'll just use this slide. But actually, this shows several different modes all on one screen with a heads-up display. Remember I said we had the uh, map company background. We do a lot of map caching in the background. So we go out to remote sites, bring your data with you. Uh, this is actually its own screen, this, this UAV control and the uh, heads-up display. Uh, we can overlay a camera view inside the heads-up display if you're first-person view. And we have these easy controls. It's basically take off, arm, pause, gears up, gears down, and uh, uh, simplicity. Just touch the screen, tell the craft where to grow, go, and uh, off it goes. The other cool thing is that you can see these polygons right here. These are the points of interest. Uh, the points of interest, you all know what that is, but we actually have a visual, visual representation of the path swept out by the craft, keeping that alignment with the point of interest. We call it augmented autonomous because at this point, it's never completely autonomous. We can take control at any point, whether it's through the tablet or the RC. Uh, I always say that part of our safety is you have your main plan, and let's say we're doing a power line inspection, you get over to your power pole, and now you're like, I'm not close enough. Well, the old method is we're going to put it into the RC mode and we're going to fly. But what if the electromagnetic field hits that, and the last command is flying towards that pole? It's not that it's, it's going to hit. With this, if it soon as it loses control, it goes back to the main plan and reverses course. So you would do actually, to get in a closer look, you'd simply do a mini plan, and we revert back to the main plan if you had issues. So this is where the demo is. You can see better on this slide, uh, where you have various points of interest and just click on the map. You can drag them, uh, place them every, wherever you want. Uh, as you, uh, really, I wish I had a parameter sequence. You tap this, up comes the parameter sequence, so just drag and drop your, uh, your points of interest, altitude, and speed. The other thing that we're doing is we're validating our flight plans using the NASA terrain data, the sh uh, shuttle data, using FAA regulations. We're using the 30 minute data. We actually uh, host all of the data on our own servers. And when you use our flight software and connect it to the internet, it goes out when you're doing your flight plan and automatically graphs three degrees around you of all your terrain data. What this allows it to do is then create a terrain map on the fly. And this point used to be down here. We hit our autocorrect, and it throws it uh, up to the correct altitude. If, however, it's above the ceiling of the FAA, it will also be flagged. So testing, 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 that's one of the things that we found uh, trying to build reliable hardware. And also, 
uh, dual sensors on almost everything. So back to the advanced functionality, what's some of the next things that we're working on right now uh, with this simple to use interface? Uh, we want to use some more of the mosaic mapping uh, where we're taking inline as path, precision locations, creating metadata, and then adding it to um, adding the imagery, setting it out automatically, and uh, norm uh, uh, or normalizing the background. And then you go to our map with us site, it automatically creates the map uh, layer uh, online, and you can share that. And it's basically like a Google map layer that you can create uh, directly from the flight software. Notice that with the orthonormalization, remember how I said that scum node uh, can talk to all of these things, all of these various components now, and what used to be a horrendously complex problem with trying to modify a flight controller turned into an easy problem for us. Automated charging is one of the other things that we're working on, uh, same sort of deal uh, with all of the information that we now talk to, we can actually uh, have precision landings, um, and uh, that's farther down on our roadmap, but it's still in production. And finally, safety, uh, we're constantly working on collision detection, whether avoidance, analyzing inputs from multiple sensors, counteracting potentially dangerous user input, um, like for instance, if you're gonna fly into a mountain, we could otherwise avoid that. Uh, safely uh, using uh, multiple input sensors, driving missing data using multiple sensors and highly System. So you actually can create your own rules on the, uh, for your craft. Where do we see the future? Well, there's a, this can be a huge list, but one of the things that we are working on is uh, AI navigation via sensors and image recognition. So uh, that's what that's what we have right now. That's what I have. 